Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. It's a gorgeous summer day. I hope you've got wonderful plans for the rest of it after you leave here today. By the way, didn't Sarah do an amazing job uh, last Sunday talking about sowing and reaping? Yeah, just a phenomenal job. And uh, if you weren't aware, uh, our adventure camp with uh, children uh, was this last week. Pastor Megan, who's our children's pastor, did a phenomenal job. We had over 100 volunteers uh, just to make sure all of the children not only were safe, but that they learned some powerful truths that will help guide them for the rest of their lives. And so, so grateful for all the work that you did. And I wanted to bring you up to speed on someone that we've been praying for. His name is Samuel. He's, he's a little guy that came into, the, uh, into our world a little earlier than expected. And uh, uh, he had to have some pretty significant surgery, and they had to relocate for that to happen. Uh, you, can see, <laughs> you can see him there. Uh, he, he's a little bit of a peanut, but the, the good news is the, the doctors keep using the same word over and over again, and it's not a common word in hospital settings, and that's the word miracle. And so little Samuel is home, and little Samuel is, yeah. Little Samuel is eating the way he's supposed to, and uh, things are going really well. Of course, there's still more journey to happen, but how many are grateful for God's care and grace that have brought him this far? Yeah. So when you think about it, just pray for Samuel. I know that he would appreciate those prayers, as does his family. Uh, uh, today, we're coming to the end of our study in Galatians, and in case you don't know, this year we've been talking about what it means for, uh, as, as human beings, as followers of Christ, how do we thrive in our world? And, and we thrive when we have access to the wisdom of God. So we talked, to, we actually spent a whole month in the book of Proverbs. And then we learned that we thrive when we are emotionally and spiritually healthy, that you can't really disconnect our emotional health and our spiritual health. And so we talked for a few weeks about that. And, and then we, we talked about we, we thrive when we are free. We thrive when we're free. And this will be the 14th week we've spent in the book of uh, uh, Galatians. And by the way, next week, we're going to uh, start a new series. We thrive when we partner with the Holy Spirit in our lives. For some people, the Holy Spirit seems very mystical. For other people, he seems like the shy member of the Trinity, the one you hear the least about. And so we're going to spend a few weeks looking at that. But today, I'd like us to conclude this series in Revela or Revelations. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's all over. <laughs> See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. There are those who want to impress people by means of the flesh. They're trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. If, if you were looking for a way to respond to some people who annoy you, it's right there in the Bible. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear in my body, or bear on my body, the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Uh, finally, free is uh, a word that uh, I occasionally hear at funerals. At funerals. Um, when people are trying to put their thoughts together about remembering someone who maybe the last season of their life has been particularly difficult. Uh, maybe they've had to go through a lot of pain. Maybe their thoughts have been a little confused. Uh, uh, maybe 
they've grieved the loss of other people in their life or the loss of some abilities. And so you'll hear it in a, in a funeral. They're finally, they're finally free. And we kind of know that in death, the, the body really knows no pain and the mind doesn't know any trouble and the heart doesn't know any sorrow. But that creates a problem for us is, is really the only way to find freedom is to no longer live. Is that what we're saying? And a lot of people are coming to that conclusion, which is why you see uh, the desire to end life on the increase and across every generation. This is not just the uh, uh, challenge for uh, people who are struggling with a, a life-altering disease. It, this starts even in middle school now and goes all the way through into as old as we're capable of living. Uh, what does it mean to live free? Uh, that's a really good thing to think about because uh, in a lot of ways, uh, we, we, we don't have choices. I am not free of the law of gravity. I'm not. Uh, I can't just float and go anywhere, anytime I want. I'm, I'm grounded to this earth just like uh, you are. And, and uh, I'm, I, I have to have food and shelter. I'm not free from needing food. Granted, I eat more food than I need, but that's not the same thing. I still need food and I need shelter because if you live in the northeast of the United States, you might survive this kind of climate right now. But when it gets to be about February, you better have a place to hide out. Uh, when I go on the, the roads, I am not free to drive however I want. I have to stop at stop signs and obey traffic lights and, and, and consider speed limits as a recommendation. Uh, <laughs> So does this mean we are not free? And, and that's what a lot of people think. Is it, possible, is it possible to live in a country that's afforded us a lot of liberties and yet not be free? Is it possible to be incarcerated in a prison for a crime that's committed and yet still experience freedom? And Paul insists that that's true. So now we have to figure out, well, what is this freedom that is not a matter of some kind of law that's been afforded me a privilege and not a matter of some law that's incarcerated me because of a crime? What is this freedom? And, and the Apostle Paul, who's an early leader in the Christian church, he wasn't one of the original 12 followers of Jesus, but, but he becomes a, a prominent leader. And he did have a personal interaction with Jesus. And, and he begins to talk about this idea of freedom. And he comes up with this symbol of freedom, which is really interesting to me. And it's not a symbol that you and I would expect. Like, we have symbols of freedom in our own country. There's the American flag is a, is a symbol of freedom in the United States. The, the American bald eagle is a symbol of freedom in the uh, United States. Uh, uh, we, we have these symbols of freedom, but for for Paul, he says, for Christianity, the, the symbol of freedom is the cross. For Christians, the symbol of freedom is the cross of Christ. Now, that is a very strange symbol since a cross was used to do two things, to cause a painful death and send a message to anybody who thought like the person who was dying. How can that be a symbol of freedom. Look at what Paul says. May I never boast except, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What do you boast about? Are you good at a sport? Did you used to be good at a sport? I hear people tell their stories accomplishments back in high school and, and football as though they occurred yesterday, and it's been a while. <laughs> of a job that you landed, uh, of your GPA in school. I never boasted about my GPA. I had to give explanations to my parents for my GPA. <laughs> about your cooking, maybe you're a really good cook. About your physique. I mean, some of you, when you look in the mirror, you like what you see. For a lot of us, that's not the case. We, we have to go to the mirror with blinders. We try not to look too close too long. So what 
do you have to boast about? And, and Paul had a lot to boast about. In terms of intellect, he was a brilliant theologian. He had mastered and was fluent in multiple languages. He was revered and powerful. Anywhere he went, he got the seat of prominence. And, and, and yet, he was not free. He was not free. He's very much enslaved. The, the cross of Christ is offensive. And if it hasn't offended you, you haven't thought about it very much. When I look at the world and, and they get offended with Christianity, the reason they get offended with Christianity by and large is the cross of Christ. And in case you don't know, the cross is capable of offending anybody and everybody. Uh, to progressive people, it offends them because it represents intolerance. How dare you say that Jesus is the only way to God? How dare you say that? And yet to conservative people, it represents an equity that they're not comfortable with. Are you saying there's no difference between me and other people who flout any of the laws of morality? They just live however they please. Are you saying there's no distinction? We're all in the same boat. It's offensive. It's offensive. The cross reveals though that God is with us and that he is for us, that God was not a distant observer of all that was going on in our world. He enters it and he doesn't just enter it incognito, he enters, enters it incarnate. The word becomes flesh, God becomes flesh and dwells among us. And all the things that we experience, he experienced. Does anybody else get tired besides me? You're so tired you can't even raise your hand. We get tired, we get disappointed, we get disillusioned, all of these things. And Jesus comes into our world and experiences all of that. And he doesn't come in in order to judge us or to condemn us. John's Gospel, chapter 3, makes this critically and unequivocally clear. He's not here for judgment and he's not here for condemnation. He's here to rescue us. And, and if you think people are offended by by judgment, you have no idea how offended they can be by rescue. Oh, just try it sometime. Don't, but you know, think about it. All right, I really need to say, don't do this. But you know, there's a person swimming in a pool and, and you jump into the pool and you grab them around their waist and you start swimming them to the side and you know, what are you doing? I'm rescuing you. And they'll tell you, I wasn't drowning. What are you doing? And when God comes to rescue us, people are offended because they assume they can save or rescue themselves. They're not underwater. They're not desperate. Things aren't that bad. They'll figure it out. So the cross is horribly offensive. It, it offends the non-religious people because they believe they're free of religion, like they don't need that. It offends religious people because they do not need to be rescued. They're already doing the things that, that rescued people are supposed to be doing. And so, and, and this is what the cross says. Your sins are so bad. This is so, this is so hard to hear. So hard to hear. Your sins are so bad, they're worthy of death. not my sins. I know some people, but not me. I've seen them on TV, not me. I'm married to somebody, but not me. <laughs> and, and God insists on this, that when you live the way you live, it leads to death, and there's no exception to that. And what he does is he comes in and he says, I will take, I will take the death on me. I will die in your place. Do you see how offensive Christianity is to everyone? To everyone. 
This freedom that Paul talks about is not dependent on optimal circumstances, everything going the way that you want it to. Uh, you could put this man in prison and he was still free after being beaten in the middle of the night to sing praises to God. Are you free? He would be on a ship and it would go down. They'd have to swim to shore to survive. And when he got on shore, he could preach the gospel. Are, are you that free? There were people he could not convince no matter what he said or how he said it. And they even persecuted him. And it did not change his approach. It did not change his language. It didn't change his heart. He was free. What's the source of that kind of freedom? What's the source? May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. When the world has failed to keep its promises and you're disappointed, or it's managed to keep its promises when it was trying to intimidate and hurt you, what are you to do when you have failed to keep your own promises? What are you to do? Freedom comes from what God has done for us, not what we have done or failed to do. So we've got this idea that freedom is something, it only has value if I gave it to myself. And what Paul reveals to us is that freedom is not a gift we give to ourselves. Freedom is what God does for us. In a collusion between state and religion, Jesus was falsely accused, he was arrested, he was tried, and he was crucified. And I have no doubt that in that moment, there were the enemies of Jesus who said things like, we're finally free of that guy. But they weren't really free, they were very still bound. Jesus was free because God does resurrection. How many are glad in this house this morning that God does resurrection? Like, death is not the end. It's not the end. And Jesus knew this a long time before he's on the cross. He doesn't discover this after he breathes his last, last and all of a sudden he finds himself alive again, alive again and he goes, what? You know, that, that's, not, that's not in the Bible. That's not how it was. He told us long before in John's gospel. Look at what he says in John 12. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul is not claiming that the world is dead. He's just saying the world is dead to him. What does that mean? The world is dead to him. And, and what it means is, is that there's nothing in the world that could manipulate Paul into thinking, I need that in order to be secure, to have my identity. To, to understand who I am, why I'm here. Have you ever experienced any of this from the world? Have, have you ever been told in the world that you have to look a certain way or, or dress a certain way or, you know, people won't accept you? You have to have a certain amount of money. You have to live in a certain neighborhood. You have to have a certain connection. You have to work a certain job or, you're just looked down on, you're less than. You have to be in the right circle of friends, you have to be right connected, you have to be in the right networks. If, if you're not, then, then, see, if you can just get those things, then, then I will be free. Then I will be accepted, by who? And how long do you think that acceptance will last? Um, look at what it says in John 12, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground, Paul says, I'm dying to the world and the world is dying to me. The world is losing its ability to control me. Interesting. Uh, by the way, resurrection is not, I don't know what you think resurrection is. 
Uh, it's, it's not resurrection when things turn out the way you want them to. Uh, the, the company downsides and you kept your job. Oh, whew, resurrection power. Mm, that's not it. Uh, you're waiting for the test results and the doctor has been very concerned and it comes back and it's benign. Oh, resurrection. Uh, relief and resurrection are not the same thing. Resurrection is not what you do. Resurrection is what God does. When humans do all they can do, we get crucifixion. All you have to do is pay attention for five minutes in our world and just watch how humans treat each other. Just watch. We're heading into a political season. Well, I guess now we're always in a political season. And do you know what I've noticed? Both sides will crucify the other side. And both sides claim some kind of superiority. It's the world. And attaching a cross to one side or the other doesn't make it resurrection. I, I don't know how to break it to you, but winning an election is not a resurrection. And crucifying people along the way just because they don't agree with you is not the way of Jesus. Jesus was persecuted, Jesus was crucified. How did Jesus act? Quite different. Freedom isn't afraid of hard questions. Freedom isn't afraid of hard times. Freedom can embrace all of life, including the hard and painful parts, including the end of life. That's what freedom is able to do. What would freedom look like to you in a marriage? Oh, <laughs> for some people, freedom would look like, finally, I'd be married. And for some people, finally, I'd be out of this marriage. An old pastor one time told me that marriage is like flies on a screen door, some wanting in and some wanting out. <laughs> Do you know what's true? There are things that could release life into your marriage, and there are some of us that will not have the conversations that could release it because we're afraid it will end the marriage. Or we'll get a cold shoulder. Or we'll have an argument. Is that freedom? Parent-child relationship. Well, if I, if I weigh in on that, my, my child might not like me. Your, your child's not gonna like you until they have a mortgage. That's just how it is. I repent of that. We live in, we work in work environments and there are things that could be better, there are things that could be improved, there are things that could be addressed, but we don't wanna be the one who rocks the boat. Is that freedom, really? Well, then I would be on the out, I would be looked down on, I might lose my, okay. Is that freedom? Is that freedom? Paul, Paul gives us a, a surprise. He says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Now, I'm not changing the subject. This is a very surprising statement because all along he's been saying, these people want to impose circumcision on you. This, this, is, this is wrong. Don't fall into that group. They're just trying to please other people. They just want approval from somebody else. They want to be able to brag about who they got to get circumcised. Don't do that. We expect him to say, it's not about circumcision. Be the uncircumcised group. But he, he surprises us. He says, neither one is freedom. Neither one is anything. We're surprised by this. Both circumcision and uncircumcision represent ways people try to save themselves. We try to save ourselves by earning our salvation through the works we do, or we try to save ourselves by trying to snatch some kind of fleeting joy in the remaining days we have left. And Paul says, neither one of those things are anything. One group wants to be free of temptation and the other group wants to be free of regulation and both groups are trying to save themselves.
They're the same. And the gospel is the only thing that gives us an alternative. If we're trying to save ourselves, it's not freedom, it's slavery. What counts, what counts is the new creation. I'm gonna have the worship team come up. This is what Paul tells us and we're surprised by it. God is not interested, God is not interested in making better humans. God is interested in making new humans. It's a new creation. And what he tells us is, is that his pursuit of this kind of freedom, of the new thing that God is creating in him, it's left a mark on him. He says, I bear in my body the marks of Christ. And the word that's used in the Greek language is stigmata. And uh, if you're familiar, particularly in the Catholic Church, there's been a history throughout Roman Catholicism of people who suddenly had uh, the, the wounds of Jesus appear on their flesh. There have been 321 confirmed cases over the last 2,000 years. Uh, whip marks on the back, uh, nail pierced hands. And, and Paul isn't saying, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, look, th these have supernaturally appeared on my hands. You see that? That's, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, is I have preached the cross of Christ and the result of that is that I have been heavily persecuted. These are not supernatural marks on my body. These are the marks that come from daring to live, from daring to live a free life. He was imprisoned, he was jailed, he was accused, he was beaten. And he could show you the wounds. <laughs> that, and he could name the city. And he would tell you, it was worth it. Because I found out you can't imprison freedom out of me. You can't shipwreck uh, freedom out of me. You can't beat freedom out of me. You can't persecute freedom out of me. I walk in the freedom of God and it doesn't matter what I face or what faces me. I am free whom the sun sets free is free indeed. How free are you? Really? If freedom is just defined as, I don't have to do anything I don't want to, or I get to do what I want to, those are just personal preferences. Really? How many people are gonna do the hard thing if, that, if their definition of freedom is just to avoid all of the hard things. Hmm. Jesus has not come to make you better or to make you feel good. He has come to make you free. And yes, there will be some marks you bear for that freedom. But dear God, our world needs to see some evidence of resurrection, not just people who are running from their problems. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, um, something in our heart craves to be free. That has to come from you. Something in our heart is afraid to be free because we've seen what it's cost other people. Would you help us know that our freedom is not dependent on our circumstances, our freedom is dependent on what you do, and you do resurrection. When the world has done all it can do to stifle, stop, and end us, it's not the end of us. You are the God of the resurrection, and we live in that freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.